Please welcome Dr. Karen DeSalvo. Well, hello and welcome everybody to the checkup with Google Health. This year we're coming to you live from New York City where it's snowing today and we're streaming all around the world. I'm Dr. Karen and I'm excited for you to hear about the progress we're making in helping everyone everywhere live a healthier life. The future of health is consumer driven. People will expect a mobile first experience with more personalized insights, services and care. That means enterprises, including Google, will need to evolve to meet consumers where they are. Google Health is our company-wide effort to do just that, building health into the products and services people already use every day. In my years practicing medicine, I learned that the right information at the right time saves lives. That's why I came to Google, to help organize the world's health information and make it universally accessible and useful. Information is a determinant of health. I bet it's not a surprise to you that three out of four people turn to the internet before they seek care. You've probably done that yourself. I know that I have. Information is a determinant of health. And in fact, every day, millions of people go to search and ask health-related questions. In 2021 alone, health videos on YouTube were viewed more than 100 billion times. By delivering authoritative and authentic health information, we're helping people find agency to navigate their health journey. Consumers also rely on Google hardware for more personalized insights about their steps, their sleep, and heart health, all to inform a healthier daily lifestyle. More than a billion, excuse me, more than three billion devices on the planet run on Android. Solutions built on that Android operating system put health tools in the hands of consumers and their caregivers. Healthcare and life sciences organizations turn to cloud to unlock data-driven innovation that meets the consumer-driven future head on. And this will be transformative. You know, another thing I learned practicing medicine is that it doesn't actually matter if you have all the right information or even the best tools if you haven't first established a solid foundation of trust. Health moves at the speed of trust. Google works to establish that trust with our users by not only building products that are safe and effective, we also design products with our core values in mind, equity, ethics, security, and privacy. We firmly believe that when Google partners with consumers, caregivers, and communities, we can democratize access to health, and together, we can solve the world's biggest health challenges. So that brings me to today and this opportunity to show you how we're helping billions of people live healthier lives. As an AI first company, we're applying our advanced technologies to go from early research to practical clinical reality. You'll see what new possibilities lie ahead with AI, including large language models. We'll provide updates on how we're creating useful, actionable information to connect people to the right care. And we'll show you how sensors and devices you use every day are making insights more personal. You'll hear how we're applying our technology to respond to one of the biggest threats to the public's health, climate change. Our partners and YouTube creators will share how they're using our tools and technology to enable the future of health. So let's get to it. To kick us off, let me hand it over to Yossi, who will talk about the transformative potential of AI in health. Yossi? Thanks, Karen. Hello, everyone. I'm Yossi, and I lead impact driven research at Google. For over 16 years, I've been developing advanced technologies and AI solutions, as well as products that touch billions of people. AI is advancing at an unprecedented pace. It is a revolutionary technology that I believe will benefit almost every sector of society. And nowhere is the opportunity to help people around the world greater than in healthcare, where AI can have a transformative impact. Moving from research to clinical reality often takes years. And now we're seeing the impact of our breakthrough research, 
which is empowering healthcare professionals across medical fields, such as tuberculosis, various cancers, and eye diseases. Take, for example, diabetic retinopathy, which can cause blindness in diabetic patients if left untreated. Early diagnosis is vital. A seminal paper from our Health AI team, published in 2016, led to ARDA. ARDA stands for Automated Retinal Disease Assessment and is a screening tool to detect diabetic retinopathy. I've seen firsthand the impact of our research into diagnostics once it is ready for use in the clinic. When I was in Thailand last December, it was really inspiring to see ARDA in action and to speak to the healthcare workers using it. They are now able to screen 40 patients in just an hour. A patient sits in front of an AI-powered camera and receives the results in less than two minutes. The use of AI is helping prevent blindness with over 200,000 patients already screened worldwide. Today, you'll hear about even more ways we're using AI to help in healthcare. First, let's hear about a new line of research that I'm really excited about, recent advances in large language models and the potential medical applications. Alan. Thank you, Yossi. Hi, I'm Alan, and I lead a research team exploring AI's potential for improving healthcare. Over the past five years at Google Health, our research has shown that AI can augment a clinician's ability to detect breast cancer. It can help people better understand their skin conditions, and it can help researchers sequence genomes more accurately than ever. Today, we're publishing research in JAMA Network Open on how AI can uncover brand new medical knowledge. Here, our AI research revealed a tissue morphology feature that predicts the survival of patients with colorectal cancer. And clinicians in this research use this feature to derive new insights for their patients. Our work in this field has taught us that AI on its own cannot solve all of healthcare's problems. Medicine, after all, is about caring for people. Data and algorithms must be combined with language and interaction, empathy and compassion. What makes us healthy is complicated. It's specific to geography and it's influenced by social drivers. We believe it is imperative to actively work to include diverse experiences, perspectives and expertise when you're building AI systems. To bring this vision forward, we're exploring how AI models in medicine can use language and interactivity to be more effective more helpful and safer. Late last year, we took our first step towards rethinking conversational AI systems in medicine with MedPalm, a large language model designed to provide high quality and authoritative answers to medical questions. We built MedPalm by instruction prompt tuning Palm. Palm is a 540 billion parameter large language model from Google Research. We did this work with a small set of carefully curated medical expert demonstrations. In multiple choice questions used for US medical licensing exams, the pass mark for new doctors is often around 60%. These questions have long been considered a grand challenge for AI systems. They require a clinician to recall medical knowledge and apply logic to identify the correct answer. Despite years of effort from leading AI labs around the world, Performance on challenging tasks like this has plateaued at around 50%. Last December, our model, MedPalm, was the first AI system to exceed the pass mark. We reached a performance of over 67% on these licensing exam style questions. We also carefully examined how MedPalm performed in many other kinds of medical question answering tasks. These range from commonly asked internet search questions to complicated questions about medical research. In doing this work, we compared MedPalm's answers with answers from real clinicians, and we looked at several aspects like factual accuracy, bias, and the potential for harm. You can see one common question here, and how MedPalm answers this question, which is about incontinence. In this case, MedPalm's answer is generally sound, but it's not as comprehensive as the answer given by the clinician. The clinician here names multiple specific causes of incontinence, as you can see, 
where MedPalm is less comprehensive. And doctors rating this answer from MedPalm agreed. They found it generally accurate and safe. But you can see here that they highlighted that there's room for improvement in the level of detail our system provided. You can see from this sort of work that we're still learning. One interesting aspect of this kind of work is that the evaluating physician's rating of this answer may also change depending on their own clinical expertise and their experience in this subject area. In this next example, MedPalm's answer is complementary to the clinician's. MedPalm mentions similar information, but in different ways. And it makes this lovely point about how the severity of symptoms can vary depending on the type of pneumonia and the overall health of the person. Doctors rated this answer as very high quality across our rating framework. We believe it's really important to innovate responsibly by doing this kind of rigorous research in healthcare. Today, we're announcing results from MedPalm 2, our new and improved model. MedPalm 2 has reached 85% accuracy on the medical exam benchmark in research. This performance is on par with expert test takers. It far exceeds the passing score, and it's an 18% leap over our own state-of-art results from MedPalm. MedPalm 2 also performed impressively on Indian medical exams, and it's the first AI system to exceed the passing score on those challenging questions. There are many ways that an AI system like MedPalm can be a building block for advanced natural language processing in healthcare. And we'd like to work with researchers and experts to advance this work. The potential here is tremendous, but it's crucial that real world applications are explored in a responsible and ethical manner. And as we do that, we're looking forward to sharing our progress with you at a future checkup. Next, Greg, who leads our health AI efforts, is going to share how we're working with partners. Hi, everyone. I'm Greg, and I lead health AI at Google. In a world where it feels like we're making the impossible possible, it's so important to take a beat and evaluate whether we'll, we're building the right tools for the right people in the right way. Today, I want to talk to you about how we're using partnership to do just that. At Google Health, we work with partners both to validate and improve our technology and to go beyond research to drive real world impact. First, let's talk about ultrasound. Ultrasound is a radiation free, versatile, and increasingly more accessible early disease detection tool. It can provide real-time dynamic views of fetuses, hearts, lungs, and more. You're probably familiar with big ultrasound machines in hospitals. But in recent years, sensor technology has evolved to make ultrasound devices significantly more portable and more affordable, with many handheld devices available today for a fraction of the price. In most cases, experts, who often train for years, are required to conduct the ultrasound exam and interpret the images. But in many lower resource settings, we have a shortage of such specialists. This is an area where AI can help. In collaboration with global research teams, we have built AI models to interpret ultrasound images and identified important information, like gestational age. This can help non-experts acquire and interpret ultrasound images to triage high-risk patients simply by sweeping the handheld probe across mom's belly. Although our research has shown that AI models could do these things, that doesn't necessarily mean that AI would work in the communities that we are most interested in, in impacting. For that to happen, it's critical that we work with local partners adapting our technology to real-world conditions. Today, we're thrilled to announce two new research partnerships to help improve our ultrasound AI technology. We're working with Chang'ung Memorial Hospital, or CGMH, in Taiwan for breast ultrasound, and Jacaranda Health in Kenya for maternal health ultrasound. We chose these two regions and partners to ensure that our technology works for the caregivers and for the patients who need it most. 
For breast cancer screening, we're pushing on ultrasound because we know that conventional mammograms are often less effective for Asian populations due to the prevalence of high breast density tissue. And in sub-Saharan Africa, where maternal mortality remains high, ultrasound can be a useful tool for triaging risky cases throughout a pregnancy. While research inspires me as a scientist myself, research alone doesn't save lives. Some of our other AI tools are more mature, and after rigorous efficacy and safety evaluation, we're ready to make these models available to millions of people. One such opportunity is in the fight against tuberculosis. TB is a disease that still leads to 1.6 million deaths annually, primarily in low resource settings. Despite significant progress, mortality rates increased in both 2020 and 2021, but TB is treatable. What we need is cost-effective screening solutions to help catch the disease early and reduce community spread. For the past few years, we've published research showing that our AI models can detect signs of TB in chest x-rays as accurately as radiologists. We've even validated this research through a prospective clinical trial in Zambia. I'm excited to announce a new research collaboration with a coalition headed by Right to Care, a nonprofit organization with extensive experience in TB care within Africa. Their mission is to make AI-powered TB screening widely available across Sub-Saharan Africa. This partnership comes with a promise to deliver 100,000 free AI-powered TB screenings over the course of the collaboration. We're glad to be playing a part in the long journey to eradicate TB worldwide. But the reach of AI in healthcare goes beyond disease detection and extends into treatment. There's a huge opportunity for AI to transform cancer treatment in particular. We've been collaborating with Mayo Clinic to improve radiotherapy treatment planning and have some meaningful updates to share on that work. Radiotherapy is one of the most common cancer treatments, used to treat more than half of all cancers in the United States. But planning for radiotherapy treatment is a manual, time-consuming process for clinicians. The most labor-intensive step is a process called contouring, where clinicians painstakingly draw lines on CT scans to separate areas of cancer from nearby healthy tissue that could be damaged by radiation during treatment. The process of contouring can take up to seven hours for a single patient. Three years ago, we partnered with Mayo Clinic to start exploring how AI could help clinicians spend less time on contouring. Much like Google Maps can detect buildings and roads using AI, we build technology that could detect organs and CT scans, quickly outlining them for review by specialists. Now, together with Mayo Clinic, we're able to bring this jointly developed model to clinicians in real-world radiotherapy cases moving forward. This project is part of a broader collaboration with Google Cloud, focused on transforming health technology into regulated tools that can be easily deployed to help thousands of patients. The future of AI in healthcare is bright, and Google is working hard to bring technology from research to reality. Now, Garth will tell you about our efforts in YouTube Health. Hi, everyone. I'm Garth. And I just want to welcome colleagues, collaborators, friends, and partners joining us online, and those who are here in person in snowy New York City. I'll tell you, as someone who's born in Jamaica, it's, um, it's always interesting when it snows. Um, <clears throat> there are really a number of well-established and social and structural determinants of health, like housing and education, a lot of things that people like me and many of the folks in this room have spent their time working on. And they have proven to really have the significant impact on health outcomes. But the pandemic has highlighted a determinant that has assumed an increasingly important role in this particular digital age. Karen mentioned it before, and I'll reiterate it. That's information. 
information is a determinant of health. What does that mean? It means it drives health outcomes. It drives the decisions that people make. It drives what people think about in their lives, and it drives our community's health. At Google, we have a responsibility as an information technology company to carefully consider how we can improve our products and ensure that we're positively contributing to health outcomes. And people are looking for information in the formats that they prefer. Today's world, that means video. In 2020 alone, Karen said this before, but I'll mention it again, YouTube had over 110 billion, billion with a B, <laughs> views on health condition videos globally. So we have to ensure you can find high quality information that you can trust. To raise up content that meets these standards, we launched two key features on YouTube I want to tell you about. One is the From Health Sources content shelves to highlight videos from authoritative sources. The second thing we did was health source info panels to provide real context to help viewers identify videos from authoritative sources. We launched these features in 10 countries, and in the US and Germany, we expanded these features to include individual labels around individual professions like doctors, nurses, and mental health professions. Again, further give um, users and folks who are viewing this content cues in terms of how they can trust this information. But going a step further and building on the work of the National Academy of Medicine and the World Health Organization, today, we are really excited to announce the National Quality Forum has published a document in partnership with YouTube Health that identifies ways to advance accessibility and use of online health information by really defining this concept of quality of health information, going beyond just information that's accurate, but engaging so we can pull people in so that they can understand the messages and really feel confident in how they act and how they react. And this guide is really about how individual health creators and content, folks who are developing content can develop high quality content across all health literacy levels. And it's really important to think about health literacy when we're thinking about our communities. We've done a lot of work to ensure you can find high quality information when you come to YouTube with health questions. But a lot of times people are coming to YouTube with a human question, like how do I live with this? How do I deal with this particular challenge? And that's where we've gone a step further. And to find human answers to those questions, we we'll launch a feature that shows a shelf of personal stories where people are talking about their life experiences. And it's relevant to certain health topics like cancer and maternal health and mental health. But YouTube is not only a place for patients and families to find information about their health and connect with broader communities. It's also a platform to help healthcare professionals keep up with the latest research and best practices in clinical care. So to help clinicians expand and refresh their medical knowledge and to meet those clinicians where they are along their education journey, we joined with Harvard Medical School to pilot a really novel approach to continuing medical education using YouTube. And for the first time, content on the HMS Continuing Education YouTube channel is eligible for clinicians to claim continuing education credits. Ultimately, this pilot will help clinicians take better care of their patients using video to really bring medical concepts to life. Looking ahead, we're trying to scale how we evolve our role in supporting continuing medical education, and we're working with the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to provide best practices for video production and content strategy that's going to really help augment the quality and delivery of impactful learning experiences for health professions. It's really important at this particular time that we're really able to meet healthcare professionals where they are with information and training in a very accessible way. So by lowering barriers to access and harnessing our experience in information sharing, YouTube is working to democratize medical education in a way that really hasn't been possible before. We also want to highlight the incredible and brilliant healthcare content creators on YouTube. We actually have um, one of them here today, Dr. Mike, who we kind of claim uh, 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 as one of the OG health content creators. Um, and without creators like him and others, the platform just wouldn't exist. So we've asked a few of those amazing creators from across the world to talk about their experiences. And here they are. Testing. One, two, three. Bon My camera is ready. Mic is on. Ready to roll? Let's go. <laughs> I'm 
make videos about mental health. I try to demystify what therapy is and how it works so we're not all starting from scratch and we're there for each other. On my channel, I make videos about topics that women are often too embarrassed or ashamed to talk about. So I make it fun, I make it lighthearted. I could transform some hard uh, scientific information, difficult to understand, in an easy way for common people to understand. Mental health is, is something that can be serious and heavy, and it also can be so silly and fun. And I try to show both ends of that spectrum in my videos so that it's easier for us to talk about these things. It allows me to educate, but with some creativity, because it really allows me to kind of insert my personality and I make a lot of effort to include a range of skin tones because I really want someone watching my video to have that moment where they pause or they rewind and go, that's me, I recognize myself in that. The most important mission of a health professional is to continuously uh, give people good information about the issues. What YouTube does is that it really gives me that time to focus on the content, the quality of the content, the quality of the information, and also the reach, it's so wide. I try to bring compassion to every video I make, and that's what YouTube allows me to do is share that knowledge I have with anyone in the world. YouTube is a, a great way to make people know what you know, what you've learned. And then to also look at the way that the community, so the outpouring of support that then comes on a message when somebody has shared something personal about themselves and how they've felt better from watching the video. I believe good quality, effective, mental health information should be available to everyone, everywhere, at any time. It's something I do with the heart and with the soul. And I intend to continue to do that because I know, especially here in Brazil, how this is important to everyone. Please welcome Hema Budaraju. Wow, aren't these great examples of the power of health information that could be available for everyone, everywhere, at any time? Hi everyone, my name is Hema, and I lead our health and social responsibility work on Google Search. One of the key things that we're doing on Search is making high quality information easy to find and accessible to all. In the last year in the US, we've updated our search experience to help people go from knowledge to action. First, with a quick search, you can find information about federal government health programs such as Medicaid and Medicare. Second, it's now easier to see if a healthcare provider might accept private, employer-funded, or government-funded insurance programs. And finally, you can find healthcare providers that have available appointments at your fingertips. Making access to care easier for everyone especially those who need it the most, is a priority for us. So here are some new and expanded features you'll soon see on Google Search. Millions of people signed up for Medicaid during the pandemic. And at that time, the requirement to re-enroll each year was put on pause. That pause expires on March 31st. That's a big deal, isn't it? Because if people don't re-enroll, they will lose their healthcare coverage. To help support in this transition, we will soon make Medicaid re-enrollment information easier to find on search so people can take the right actions where they live. But what about those who might not have insurance or who are underinsured or may have Medicaid but still need to find affordable care? To help in these moments, you'll soon be able to see information for community health centers in the US that offer free or low cost care. We're focusing on community health centers because we know the access they provide to primary care has an impact. 
It's been shown to improve chronic conditions, increase the use of preventive services, and decrease ER visits. We also know how important it is when you're searching for healthcare providers that the information you find is accurate, like the clinic's phone number and address. So we've used Duplex, one of our conversational AI technologies to make voice calls to hundreds of thousands of healthcare providers in the US to verify their information on Google search. We've also used this technology to verify if providers accept certain Medicaid plans in their state. When making care decisions, it's also important to know when a provider has an open appointment. We've launched a feature last year that shows availability of healthcare appointments on search. I'm happy to share that later this year, we'll expand the network of qualified partners in the US and make it simpler for them to self-onboard. Ultimately, this will make it easier for people to get care faster. Now, besides questions about physical health, people come to search in moments of mental health crisis. In fact, Suicide is the leading cause of death among people of all ages globally. For searches about suicide in the US, we already show the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. We've been servicing crisis prevention hotlines on search around the world for many years. To expand this work to even more countries and languages, we are now partnering with ThruLine the largest verified network of mental health and crisis helplines in the world. Making high quality information more accessible for everyone who comes to search and YouTube is a priority. There's always more work to be done, but we hope to make a real difference through our continued focus on information as a determinant of health. Next up, we'll hear from Anupam about the state of mobile and wearable device sensing. Hello, thanks Hema. I'm Anupam, and I'm one of the research leads in Google's Devices and Services. I'm happy here to talk today about our research in mobile and wearable sensing, our innovations in AI, and the impacts these technologies are having on the health and wellness of our users. From features like Fitbit Sleep Profile to Mobile Vitals from Google Fit, we study and analyze data and insights to develop products and services that help users take control of their health and wellness. We focus our research and innovation on three key pillars, advancing health and sensing through AI, increasing accessibility to health and wellness products, and driving positive behavior change for our users with increased personalization. We've made strong progress across each area. Last year, Fitbit launched irregular heart rhythm notifications. These use an FDA-cleared PPG-based algorithm to look for signs of AFib in the background while the user is at rest. Since launching, more than 6 million users have enrolled across the globe, and uh, we've generated about 89,000 notifications to our users. We also brought an all new body response sensor to Fitbit Sense 2. This sensor measures continuous electrodermal activity on wrist for all day stress management. And we launched Google's flagship smartwatch, the Google Pixel Watch. This feature is Fitbit's most accurate heart rate tracking yet. When it comes to researching the next big innovation in mobile and wearable sensing, joining with Fitbit has brought a huge range of health and wellness metrics, like resting heart rate or sleep stages. This has opened up new areas of our research that we can use to improve our products and support our users' health and wellness. As always, we do this research responsibly by protecting health information from our users, and we focus on user-friendly control, privacy, and security features. We're able to use AI and machine learning to see additional health insights and discover new metrics, even when a dedicated hardware sensor might not exist. For example, I mentioned Fitbit sleep profile feature before. This features a new, uh, a new metric called stability. That metric uses both the heart rate sensor and inputs around movement to find the average number of brief awakenings that naturally happen during the night, 
And this can occur when you change sleep stages or your sleeping position. We wanted to keep learning more from our users so that we can understand how to make our devices and services more useful and helpful. To help doing that, do that, starting this month, we're making more of a health metrics dashboard feature available without a subscription. This will be available to users in, uh, and with compatible devices in countries where the feature is available. Users will be able to see their health metric trends over longer periods of time, and they'll get personalized insights on when metrics change from your baseline. This information can help uncover trends and ch changes to their well-being. These insights also help us build better products and features while ensuring that equity and inclusion are at the core. Fitbit's mission is to help everyone in the world be healthier, and we can only do that if we give as many people as possible the opportunity to impact their own health and wellness. In our research, we intentionally include a broad range of skin tones to ensure that our optical heart rate sensor systems perform best for everyone. We continue to use tools like the Monk Skin Tone Scale to improve our products and train our AI models for fairness. As you heard from Karen before, consumers are looking for health experiences that are more personalized. Personalizing the experience for Fitbit users is key to improving health outcomes and making it easier to encourage healthy habits. Today, Fitbit offers a personalized health and wellness experience for features including workout planning, activity recommendations, and goals. We know that these personalized experiences can drive more impactful health outcomes for our users, but we've only begun to scratch the surface of what we can offer. Our goal is to enable new experiences by combining an individual's longitudinal data with AI to create lasting behavior change for our users. We're also building platforms to help health innovators improve out other outcomes. So next, we're going to show you how IntelliSoft, a developer group in Kenya, is using our new open source developer stack to build an app that empowers community healthcare workers. Thanks. Every day I wake up very early in the morning. I have a lot of work to do. I'm a CHV community health volunteer. We call it a community health volunteer. We mostly target pregnant women, visiting them, check up on their mothers. My Jasmine. <laughs> if we didn't have the CHV, we will lose a lot of babies because there's nobody to come and educate the mothers. When Stella came, she told me you have to go to clinic as early as when you get pregnant so that you can be monitored. Wow, good. So much of my job is recording information. The records are very important for the mother's health. I have books, even they can't fit in my bag, you see. I really like the app because I don't need to carry all these things. I go to the app, I see everything about the mother. The app is very, very good. Good afternoon. We are here with my team to introduce Mama's Hub to you. Mama's Hub is a solution designed to be able to capture timely information about an expectant mother in the entire continuum of care. This is how it looks. You'll see the client and you're going to be able to see all her details. Timely, accurate, complete information. Enough for the health facility to save life. I'm probably too emotional about the work I do, so, so I, I think a lot about um, how can I use technology to, to improve people's lives. When we were starting to work on the development of Mama's Hub, we were constrained for time and resources. IntelliSoft told us about Open Health Stack and its capacity to help us deliver quickly. It made us feel empowered. I look at Open Health Stack as um, having a Ferrari in your hands. 
Open Health Tech is a suite of open source components for building next generation healthcare apps. These are standards based, uh, they're offline capable, secure, and adaptable to different healthcare settings. With Open Health Stack, it means that you've got all these building blocks. I'll put them together and I'll very quickly build a solution. Without Open Health Stack, Mama's Hub Fast Prototype would have taken us about nine months. With Open Health Stack, we reduced the nine months development uh, lead time to three months. Yeah, literally. With the Open Health Stack, Google deliberately designed from scratch for an environment where resources are very scarce. This tool that I'm putting in a woman's hands needs to give her the same exact privileges as somebody who's living in New York. Every mother should understand how your health is doing. I think it is important for the mother and for the unborn baby. When a mother is expectant, she needs that care. She needs that love. When you're happy, even the fetus is happy. When you're strong, even it is strong. You find that it kicks. Hmm? I just thank God that Stella and the rest of the community, they just decided to come and assist these mothers. It is awesome. Please welcome Catherine Chow. So it's really inspiring to see what IntelliSoft and Mama's Hub are doing together and what these communities are capable of. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine, and I lead product for research and innovations at Google. As you just heard, smartphones and mobile apps are vital tools for community health workers, especially in rural communities, helping them provide better and more coordinated care. These tools help people like Stella check on their patients' vital signs like blood pressure and ensure that these communities have more of a connection to their care. Ultimately, this can improve health outcomes at the population level. We know that we need to be more responsive in pandemics. We know that there's a growing burden of preventable conditions like diabetes and hypertension around the world. We know that, there, that just having access to care can save lives. There are many talented, there's, this is also why it's critical for us to ha help healthcare workers use the technology to detect where care is needed most. There are many talented health-focused developers who have worked to create such technologies, but without suitable open standards, many of these solutions built to date are only able to address a single condition. This leads to slow development in data silos, making sharing and updating information challenging and expensive to achieve. At Google, we really want to accelerate the future of digital care in low resource settings to lower the barrier to equitable healthcare. That's why we're announcing the launch of Open Health Stack, a suite of open source tools to help local developers create next generation healthcare apps. Open Health Stack uses Fire, fast healthcare interoperability resources as its underlying data standard. That makes it easier to build patient centered solutions that can connect within and across healthcare systems. For example, one component, the Android Fire SDK, makes data stored on the app secure and accessible offline so that it's safe and usable even in places without cell phone coverage or internet access. And by using Fire Analytics libraries, we make it simpler to unlock key insights and health metrics. And this can be deployed in local data centers or on the cloud. Open Health Stack also comes with robust design guidelines. This helps developers quickly adopt best practices to improve the community health worker experience. We're proud of the organic adoption by partners leveraging Open Health Stack to build new platforms that are being deployed across multiple countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. Open Health Stack adheres to privacy and safety best practices and was developed in the service of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This resulted in Open Health Stack and its components being designated as a global good by Digital Public Goods Alliance and Digital Square. We've been collaborating closely with WHO on the Open Health Stack for more than a year now to create standards-based tools. I'm happy to introduce you to Alan Labrique, Director of Digital Health and Innovations at the WHO, to talk more about how we're enabling digital transformation in healthcare and how, they're, how we're, we've been working together.
Hi folks, I'm Alan and I'm delighted to be here today to share the World Health Organization's support for this work that strengthens technologies for global health. The last three years have been such a hard road for all of us around the globe, struggling to make sense of a terrible pandemic. The pandemic has, however, highlighted WHO's necessary role in global health and the importance of a strong digital ecosystem in effective health systems, irrespective of where we may live on the planet. Countries have seen some great examples of what can be done with digital health, and governments want to drive their own digital transformation. They want citizens to be at the center of how healthcare and well-being is achieved in the next decade. WHO is proud to serve as the Secretariat for the Global Strategy on Digital Health. It's a roadmap, a vision, a set of values shared by the 194 countries that we serve. More recently, we found our member states asking for help in enabling a digital health transformation, moving away from a sea of disconnected innovation to a coordinated environment where interoperability, standards, and good governance ensure that people get the care that they need. They also want to be able to trust, to trust the quality, the security, the reliability of the systems being used in their health journeys. We at WHO are working to build those trusted protocols according to the data standards that will allow health to serve patient needs, putting people without putting people at risk of harm or exploitation. We've recently begun doing this through digital adaptations of care guidelines. We call these smart guidelines, standards-based, machine-readable, adaptive, requirements-based, and testable. But that's not enough to empower the ecosystem. So we're taking this one step further by helping to inform the development of the open health stack, which empowers countries to build and maintain the solutions around the smart guidelines, harnessing local talent, even in the most resource-constrained environments. I'm thrilled to see us move one step closer towards this new era, where interoperability is baked into the DNA of what we do as a digital health ecosystem. Interoperability is about putting people at the center and enabling continuity of care. Continuity of care is something we take for granted in many high-income countries, but which can be unlocked for people no matter where they live once we move away from broken, disconnected vertical solutions. Lastly, we're working to ensure that these systems are safe, ensuring that the decisions being recommended are correct and the data collected are used to benefit the person from whom that data is being collected and to ensure that systems are equitable, leaving no one behind, no matter their gender or socioeconomic status. Digital public goods and technologies, such as Open Health Stack, help us to achieve this vision. We're glad to be part of this journey, and we want to thank you. Please welcome Shweta Maniar and Marcus Blanc. Welcome everyone. Uh, healthcare and life science organizations are innovating to help people live healthier lives and help organizations run more efficiently. Last year was a turning point for this complex industry. The pandemic was a wake up call uh, and uh, the rapid introduction of mRNA vaccines and COVID-19 treatments dramatically changed consumers' expectations for what treatments and which treatments can be brought to market. And yet, the processes for drug discovery, preclinical pre testing, clinical trials, FDA regulatory approvals, and manufacturing and supply chain have not evolved very much in the past few years. Making data interoperable and combining that with Google Cloud's analytics, AI, and high-performance computing will reinvent the business for pharmaceutical, diagnostics, and biotechnology companies. One of the companies leading the way in this industry is Bayer, and I am pleased to be joined by Marcus Blank, 
Head of Imaging, Data, and Platform, Platform Services from Bayer. Thank you very much, Sveta, and I'm happy to be here. Welcome. So in January, Google and Bayer announced a collaborative effort to drive early drug discovery with the use of Google Cloud's high-performance computing. How do you think this can transform the way Bayer, Bayer is working and the industry overall? So we just kicked off that uh, collaboration to, its very, to this very exciting experiment. We will quantum model molecular interactions on a whole new level. Um, the objective here is to accelerate and to scale quantum chemistry calculations using Google Cloud's TPUs. The results will determine the scientific and econ economic uh, viability of um, practical applications then. Excellent. Well, in this project and many others, it needs collaboration. And uh, therefore, a collaboration space, which Bayer built on Google Cloud. So what do you think is the biggest benefit of the platform, the App Factory, on, life, on the life sciences business today? And uh, where do you think it's going to grow and have impact across Bayer? So you put, uh, you put it uh, quite right here. So the, the only way um, to the future is together, is collaboration. Yeah. Involving patients, clinicians, and other stakeholders' perspective is, is very, very important. So collaboration is key, and uh, it's key to innovation and to useful outcomes. Our internal collaboration platform allows for experimentation, such as just mentioned, uh, industrialization, and uh, going the way from idea to launch, from idea to value, efficiently. So what are the uh, main components and ingredients of the App Factory? So there are three main components for the App Factory. One is frictionless development, pipeline, excellent data, clinical trial services, um, and of course, partners, capable partners like Google. Um, we, as Bayer, have a strong research foundation as third point here um, that is in our DNA, but also external collaborations in terms of AI communi community through our incubators, such as the Life Hub in UK, uh, which is focusing on radiology, diagnostic AI, and imaging solutions. Excellent. Well, and then maybe moving on, um, thinking towards the future, right? We're talking about what's today. Thinking towards the future, are there any technologies that you're particularly interested or excited about? Yeah, talking about um, trust and digital assets, I would say blockchain um, is a good candidate for providing the trust foundation via transparency for sharing digital assets in terms of collaboration. And there's a, another one uh, point out there, far out there, is quantum computing. And this time, quantum computing, I mean the hardware, quantum hardware under the hood. And there are three points. It's quantum AI to speed up AI and AI creation. It's quantum simulation to simulate molecular, molecular, molecular interactions. Sure. And uh, it's quantum sensing. Quantum sensing is my favorite, actually, to create new medical imaging modalities. Well, um, does artificial intelligence play a role in this? And if so, <clears throat> what do you see? How do you think? So the aging populations that we see and the changing lifestyles, they lead to an increase in chronic conditions such as um, cardiovascular disease and even more severe Ill illnesses like, cancers too, like, like cancer too. The amount of data continues to grow um, and increasing complexity as uh, a dis disproportionate rate when compared to the number of available staff. So we have too much data for too few people. Well, <clears throat> so let's talk about our organizations for a moment. Google believes in democratizing information for all, and Bayer's vision is health for all and hunger for none. How do you, how, can you share how you think these two coincide with our particular partnership that we have? So let me focus on the health for all part. We all are patients at some points in our lives, right? So I recently went through a very intense patient journey with someone very close to my heart. And it's quite clear what patients want. They want accurate and timely diagnosis that puts them on their way to feel better soon. Um, providing the potential to support healthcare professionals, that's what actually we want to do, right? right? Uh, to handle increased workload, to reduce diagnostic errors, to give them time back to focus on more 
complex cases because we are all individuals and standardization is sometimes not um, optimal. And that's where Google Cloud and Bayer have like an overlapping ambition. We would want to connect the dots and assist healthcare professionals and their patients making informed decisions at critical steps within their journey back to health. Marcus, thank you so much for sharing such a personal story and, and, and also what motivates you on how you're working here um, at Bayer. Uh, it is great to hear the perspective on digital transformation taking place in the pharmaceutical industry uh, and to gather inspiration from what Bayer is doing uh, with the latest cutting edge technology. Uh, at Google Cloud, we know firsthand how challenging it is to bring massive amounts of data together and to make sense of it and unlock it with its value and analytics, uh, with analytics and AI. So this is why this is so important for us to combine our expertise in cloud computing, data, and AI with life sciences experts, with life sciences experts like yourself in the domain. Uh, and then, therefore, to help organizations solve some of the toughest problems in the world. Marcus, thanks for being with me here today uh, to help us shine the spotlight on some of the transformational opportunities we have in this space. Thank you very much for that. And with that, next, we'll have Monsi join us to talk about the work that we're doing to help mitigate the impacts of climate change on public health. Please welcome Monsi Kunsel. Hi everyone, I'm Mansi, a product manager on our public and environmental health team. One of the biggest threats to public health is climate change, as declared by the WHO, and that's why I'm here today. Extreme temperatures are being reported across the globe. Heat-related health risks like heat stroke, dehydration, and more are especially concerning. A 2021 study showed roughly half a million deaths are associated with extreme heat events every year. And in the US, deaths from heat jumped 56% from 2018 to 2021, a span of just three years. Local governments and public health organizations around the world are working to keep their communities safe and healthy during heat waves and improve long-term resilience to future extreme heat events. We're exploring how we can bring the best of Google to help. We've been supporting public health organizations with tools and data sets, using machine learning models to help forecast natural disasters like floods and wildfires, alerting communities before the areas are impacted. We have an opportunity to bring data and tools to help mitigate impacts of extreme heat as well. We are constantly working on cutting edge solution to such problems. So here, we turn to the most innovative public health technology since the Big Bang. Trees, yep, <laughs> trees. First of all, cities lack natural greenery at the dense concentration of concrete surfaces that absorb and retain heat. And what do you get? An urban heat island. This is where Tree Canopy from a climate data and insights tool, Environmental Insights Explorer comes in. We combine Google's AI capabilities and aerial imagery to help cities assess their tree canopy coverage and plan future, and plan future tree planting projects. We piloted this data with the city of Los Angeles in 2020. And now a program called Streets LA is using it as one tool to plant enough trees to shade 200 city blocks across eight LA neighborhoods. Building on this, we are supporting nonprofit organizations taking action on the ground. We are happy to announce that Google.org is providing a $450,000 grant to support American Forests, a nonprofit focused on creating healthy and resilient forests. Our goal is to help them expand their suite of free urban forestry tools and to provide more refined and accurate guidance around heat related tree canopy needs. These insights can help governments and others make important forestry-related decisions to positively impact the health of communities. We're also exploring how interventions like cool roofs can help in urban settings. Cool roofs are a great cost-effective heat mitigation and adaptation strategy because they reflect sunlight and absorb less heat. That leads to reduced indoor temperatures and improved health outcomes. 
and Kulus have enormous potential in low-income communities that don't have access to air conditioning. We are leveraging Google's aerial imagery and our AI algorithms to generate high-res roof solar reflectivity measurements. We are in the early stages of exploring how these roof maps can help urban planners and governments expand the adoption of cool roofs in their cities and states. Our tool will offer insights to governments along dimensions like social vulnerability, allowing them to identify priority areas for cool roof interventions and measure the impact of their interventions. Mitigations like increasing the number of cool roofs or tree coverage in a community can have substantial impact on lowering temperatures and ultimately reducing health risks. That's why we're doing our part to help mitigate the impact of climate change on public health. And now I'll pass it back to Karen. Well, thank you, Monty, and thank you to all of our presenters, especially our partner guests. We are so excited about the work happening all across Google to bring to life this vision of a future of health, one that's consumer-driven, mobile-first, more personalized, and truly gives people agency over their own health and wellness. I want to thank you all for joining us today for the Checkup with Google Health, and that is a wrap. <laughs>